thank you everyone for coming. I hope you've appreciated the selection of music we, we chose for the prelude. Uh, <laughs> it felt like I was walking into a spa. <laughs> um, anyways, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, we're very, very glad to have uh, new friends and, and uh, old friends from the Urban Democracy Lab come and uh, share this conversation with you tonight. This is a conversation that we've been having in some ways since last year when we, uh, when Miriam was here last time and we were discussing the democratizing the green city framework. So I'll let um, Miriam introduce the rest of the panel. Well, let me introduce Miriam Greenberg. Miriam is, is a friend of, of the Urban Democracy Lab, a professor at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, she, to me, is one of the best examples in social science in the United States today of a kind of engaged interdisciplinarity. Her book in New York, uh, Branding New York, set the agenda in a certain line of discussion for a long time. And while people are still catching up with that, she has moved in other directions and is setting other agendas with her critical sustainabilities work. So Miriam, thank you so much for introducing the panel and for coming tonight. Thank you, Jean Paolo, and it's really an honor to be here. Um, and thank you to the Urban Democracy Lab and to all the folks, um, Rebecca and others, who helped to organize and bring us all together tonight, um, as well as to Daniel Aldana Cohen and uh, Hilary Angelo, who helped to conceive of the Democratizing the Green City program and agenda. Um, I'm very honored to introduce our distinguished guests on this panel. Um, and I think what I'll do is I'll introduce them all at the beginning and then you'll remember who they are and they will present and then I'll offer a few reflections and we'll open it up for discussion. Um, so first we have Andrew Diener, Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Connecticut. His research and teaching interests include urban neighborhoods, urban and regional infrastructures, inequality, culture and consumption, and qualitative methods. His first book um, on the neighborhood of Venice in Los Angeles. Venice, a contested Bohemia, <clears throat> was published by the University of Chicago Press in 2012. It draws on six years of ethnographic research, 145 oral history interviews, and archival research to explain how and why some neighborhoods maintain race and class diversity while others become more exclusive. And his second book is really leading into the questions of infrastructures and resilience and their discontents that building on that work, the previous work, and then moving in this direction um, more explicitly. Uh, and his proposed book, Feeding Philadelphia, Risk, Efficiency, and the Transformation of the Food System, is currently under review. And it is based on archival research, 190 interviews with food industry stakeholders. That's a lot of interviews. And two years of ethnographic field work in market settings and distribution hubs. He is also writing a book with Jonathan Wynn about urban culture that is under contract with Oxford University Press and is conducting ethnographic and historical research with Claudia ben -Zekri about the transformation of urban fashion districts and the global circulation of design. So wide ranging and very relevant interests. We're also very pleased to have with us uh, Oscar Sosa Lopez, PhD candidate at the University of California Berkeley's Department of City and Regional Planning with a concentration in global metropolitan studies. His research interests include the politics of urban infrastructure, globalization, cities and citizenship, sustainable urban and regional development, and urban planning theory. His dissertation takes the case of transportation policy reform in Mexico City to analyze how global urban governance agendas are adapted into local institutional and political settings. His research on Latin American planning, the U.S.-Mexico border, and immigrants, immigration, excuse me, immigrant spaces in the United States has appeared in Environment and Planning A, Regional Development Dialogue, and the Berkeley Planning Journal. And finally, very pleased to introduce Melissa Checker, who is the Hagedorn Professor of Urban Studies at Queens College and faculty member in the PhD program in anthropology at the Graduate Center of C C the CUNY Graduate Center. Uh, her research focuses on environmental justice, urban sustainability in the United States, the social justice implications of the green economy, and grassroots activism. She is the co-editor of the now out volume, Sustainability in the Global City, Myth and Practice. Her book, 
Polluted Promises, Environmental Racism and the Search for Justice in a Southern Town, won the 2007 Association for Humanistic Sociology Book Award and was a finalist for the Julian Stewart Award and Delmos Jones and Jagna Scharf Memorial Book Prize. She also co-edited with Maggie Fishman, Local Actions, Cultural Activism, Power, and Public Life, and has authored a number of academic articles and book chapters, as well as articles for popular magazines and newspapers that have really helped to set the agenda on linking questions of environmental justice uh, and urban planning, as well as gentrification and greening. Um, and finally, she is currently conducting ethnographic research from which her talk today um, will be drawn um, in, on Staten Island in New York City and is interested in questions of greening processes in Staten Island generally in relation to environmental justice as well as in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy. Uh, thank you and please welcome, join me in welcoming our very wonderful panel tonight. Well, I'll, I'll introduce myself again, Oscar Sosa. I'm very happy to be here. I, I want to thank Gianpaolo and, and Becky for inviting me and, and the rest of the panelists. Uh, I'm, I'm really, really excited to take part in this, in this, uh, in this conversation. Um, was this minutes on? Yeah, well, I'm, I, I'm gonna be talking about my, my dissertation work. I don't have a book uh, manuscript in contract yet. Um, <laughs> I, I, I want to enter into the debate around um, like critical sustainability uh, to, to the study of transportation infrastructure in Mexico City. And what I want to be presenting here um, comes from the field, the field work research that I conducted from a dissertation for about 16 months, mainly between 2012 and 2013 in Mexico City. Um, uh, in, since 2006, there's been a series of governance transformations and, and physical interventions that have been taking place in the city that I am obs I'm, 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 um, analyzing as part of an ongoing transportation reform. No? And, a, and a central component of this reform is the, ap the appearance of mobilidad or urban mobility uh, or sustainable mobility, which I will use interchangeably today, uh, as a new way of understanding the role of transportation infrastructure. Um, Mobilidad links uh, transportation. To think of mobilidad is to think about linking transportation infrastructure with discourses of sustainability and the production of a more inclusive city. Um, most of these interventions have taken uh, have taken the form of a BRT system, bicycle and pedestrian, and pedestrian inf uh, interventions, a lot of public space. Um, but there's also some contradictions that I'm going to try to flesh out now or perhaps later, uh, which have to do with the fact that these projects and infrastructures are being constructed at the same time that, that there's been an expansion on toll roads or, or urban highway networks in the city, all of them conceived by the government as part of this mobilidad policy. No? Um, I'm not going to discuss the, the each case in uh, uh, detail because of time constraints, but I want to give you a sense of the scale and location of these projects. Uh, Metrobus is one of the largest, uh, the fastest expanding BRT systems in Latin America. It's currently moving about a million people a year. It has five lines and it's expected to have between 10 and 15 more lines in the next five to 10 years, uh, depending on who you talk to. Um, this uh, BRT, it's important to, to mention that it's not a system that came to expand the capacity of transportation in terms of routes. It's more uh, uh, a project or a system that is replacing uh, semi-regulated or semi-unregulated um, low capacity uh, vehicles or microbuses or busetas or however you want to call them, no? uh, depending on where you are. The other, th the other project is Ecovici, which is the local uh, bike share system that's it's, it's going on its fifth year. It moves around 100,000 users each day. Um, um, and it's complemented with a small network of bicycle lanes, bicycle parking, and, and some traffic signaling and a few that uh, retrofitting of the cities to make streets a little bit more safe for, for cyclists. Um, and another one, it's Eco Park, which is uh, the one that I have down in the corner. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, an electronic parking meter system uh, operated privately. Uh, there's, there's, there's about uh, 1,200 of them in eight uh, specific locations in the city. These are mixed-use areas that in recent years have 
have shifted from being residential to becoming uh, centers of, of, of office space and, 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 and retail space. No? Uh, this, this is a very interesting uh, project. Uh, it basically allows companies to buy and operate the system and the, the companies will give 30% of the revenue back to the city and the city uses that money to invest in public space improvements, uh, which have to take place in the same area where the money came, uh, was, was, uh, the revenue was collected. No? Uh, just to get a, a sense of where this is in terms of Mexico City, uh, they're basically focused in the central areas and I'm gonna talk about how this signals uh, some interesting dynamics going on. Uh, I also wanna mention that these are fast growing systems. Uh, this is a, 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 an expansion on the, on the making. However, they still represent a very small percentage of the, of the, of the, of the money that's spent in, in urban infrastructure, which is still going mainly to, to car infrastructure. No? Um, so the, 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 um, the, the advent of mobilidad policy as a concern, as a policy space, I think signals an important shift in the way transportation infrastructure is being understood in Mexico City. It has come to redefine a longstanding problem in Mexico, which is air pollution and traffic congestion. Um, and now these problems are being thought of as issues of sustainability concerning carbon reduction, emissions, and about democracy concerning public space and mass transit. Um, so the meaning However, the meaning of what sustainable and democratic means remains ambiguous. I'm gonna try to flesh out some of these ambiguities, uh, but I think also this will be something that we can talk about later. Um, so these projects have been conceived as, as, as being green policies, no? and they're discursively described as such, uh, especially the government and the policy actors are, are thinking about it in these terms. Uh, but the truth, like, like I mentioned, is that they come to exist in parallel to large investments in car infrastructure and part of other or larger projects. No? So I think it's important to think about these this infrastructures, these projects, as, um, as parts of reform that, 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 yes, they try to address Mexico City's chaotic transportation planning and urban development context, but they're also technologies that give the city, the city government, expansive capacity to deal with political constraints and to manage territory. And this becomes uh, especially evident in two issues. Uh, one is in the way that the BRT has allowed the city government to deal with the so-called transportation or bus mafias, um, which are the, the uh, 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 great number of semi-independent, semi-regulated uh, small bus operators, owners. Um, BRT as a public, private, but mainly a private uh, enterprise has allowed the city to regain control on the provision of, of services. We are having to resort to, to uh, heavy subsidies or to the, of making a public company as it did in the past. No? Um, and these technologies are also uh, uh, allowing new ways of dealing um, with terri managing territory and space. Uh, these infrastructures are, are, are tools that, are, that, that help tidy up and rationalize public space. Uh, they're embedded in larger efforts to revitalize central areas of the city around very specific corridors, very targeted areas, uh, very profitable markets, to put it yeah, more bluntly. Um, so they are enablers of urban restructuring and uh, of a turn towards the central city after several decades of, of urban expansion in Mexico. No? Uh, just to give you an example, um, um, Eco Park is it, it, replacing, um, I don't know if I have that image, Eco Park, which is the, the parking system, is replacing informal uh, franeleros, as we call them in Mexico, informal workers that manage space, uh, parking spaces in the in the in the city. You give them a, a small fee, and they watch your car and they let you park. Uh, now those are being replaced by a by a very rational and centralized system, no? and that allows for new ways of managing revenue, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and very quickly, because I know I'm going to be short on time. I also want to, I just want to point to, to the, the historical moment in which this, this focus on transportation comes to exist or comes to be, uh, which has to do with, with, the, with the politics of, of elect, electoral politics in Mexico City. Mexico City was recently democratized and uh, recently um, just the, the last uh, capital in Latin America to become democratic after many years. And, 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 and projects such as Metrobús and the work that Marcelo Brad did after uh, Lopez Obrador to, to expand this, this system that became, that started as a, as, a, as a climate change experiment funded by the World Bank into a comprehensive uh, green 
urbanism project called uh, uh, Plan Verde, uh, uh, which in which transportation was a central central point. Um, it kind of uh, matches uh, the the uh, it, I mean, it matches the, the way the, or the moment that these actors uh, start to think majors start to think of their positions as platforms for which they can contend as presidential candidates. No? So I want to think of these projects as embedded in the larger aspirations, not only of the city as becoming cutting edge and innovative and sustainable, but also of political actors and one national and, and, and global recognition. No? And for those of you that follow uh, Mexico News, Marcelo Ebrard in 2010, actually this worked out pretty well for him. He became, uh, he was awarded the mayor of the year and then he became the head of the World Mayor's Council on Climate Change. Now, whether this is eventually gonna help him become president of the country, it's a different story. No? Um, uh, and, and, and Miriam had gave us a, a few, a few uh, pointers. Uh, and, and she wanted to think, and she wanted us to think about how this infrastructure is connected to different kinds of politics. Um, I think that the, these infrastructures that I've been discussing signal the entrance of a constellation of actors such as NGOs, international funding organizations, international NGOs, and experts into local policy making. I think particularly important are the NGOs, international NGOs such as Embark and ITDP, who belong to a, long, to a large global sustainable transportation complex. Uh, some icons might sound familiar, look familiar to you. Uh, these organizations broker um, between international agencies and local institutions and other relevant actors, which can be local activists, politicians, uh, federal fund sources of federal funding. They can bring funding from abroad as well. Huh? And they're, they're, they're coming into stage has, has, has led to the creation of new spaces for political engagement uh, that are increasingly relevant for policy making in Mexico City. Uh, I'm talking about forums, conferences, round tables. Uh, I'm also talking about the production of a great deal of, of information on best practices and how to implement projects um, um, that are targeted at educating citizens, but also public officials and, and decision makers. No? Uh, but these actors also play a very interesting role uh, um, uh, they, they play the game of carrots and sticks pretty well. Um, they give awards when governments or, or the local government does what they want or they follow their agendas, but they also reprimand them when they don't. And this is just a quick, one quick example. Uh, ITDP and the Peace of Denmark is given uh, the Mayor Mancera uh, an award for being the best cyclo city, cyclo, cyclo, bicycle friendly city and the Cyclo Cities Award. Uh, we can talk about what does these awards mean, uh, which it's very debatable, but uh, what I wanna, what I wanna point out is that, that, that these experts are taking part in all the stages of, of, of infrastructure planning and, and policy making in the city. You know? they are, they're, they're participating in the agenda setting, in the implementation, and also in the evaluation of, 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 of programs and of infrastructure. You know? um, just uh, another issue related to, to to democracy, this, 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 I think it's important to pay attention to how the focus on transportation has coincided with, with uh, in, an, in other ways, in the process of democratization of Mexico City. So there's ideas about the green city and that have been picked up by the PRD, by the local government, uh, and they, they have become a, a central component of the political project, no? And the PRD, the, gov the people in, in the office will tell you, you know, every time we spend money in, in mass transit or in mobility, we're actually addressing the needs of, of low income residents. This example is like the new, the new hierarchy that they have devised that it's supposedly reflected in the new transportation law in the city, which puts uh, pedestrians at the top and cars at the bottom. No? Um, but sustainable transportation infrastructure has also been conceived as a part of a project of co-governing, co which is central to the PRD and it speaks of its, of its history, historical ties to the, cent to the urban social movement. No? So the city posture has always been that deepening, that in the designing of, of mobilidad policy, civil society is gonna have a central role and that citizens are gonna be very important key decision, very important decision making actors. No? Uh, in practice, however, uh, and this is getting to, to, the, to the interesting point, is that, 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 that mobility, the public policy has been conceived through a very exclusionary processes through which only a narrow group of civil society actors, uh, namely NGOs and experts, have, have, really, uh, have a real saying, and where citizens' input rarely, rarely has a, a tangible effect on the design of policies or on the implementation of projects. No? Uh, one example would be uh, that I'm, I, 
No, I didn't bring a, 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 I'll show a picture later, is the, 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 the controversy around the implementation of Echo Park of the, of the, of the, of the um, parking meter system, which is conceived by the city as the first step into achieving some form of congestion control along the lines of what uh, London has been doing. No? So uh, the uh, citizens were opposing this project, and these were not just any citizens, they were citizens that were lower income residents of neighborhoods like Roma or Condesa that were gonna be unequally uh, affected by parking restrictions. No? Um, so these interventions uh, bringing about a redefinition of public space, who are its users and what it means to be a citizen. But it's also part of a larger efforts to improve the face of certain areas of the city. And these are projects that are, that, that, and, and as they are materialized and they, 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 they become real, they're reinforcing and shifting patterns of inequality. Um, like in other words, while discursively they're addressing the needs of the most, in practice they have clear beneficiaries. Uh, for example, Ecovici, uh, most of the bicycle infrastructure has been focused in the areas of the city where not, they have not been focused on the areas of the city where most of the bike trips take place, which are the dark areas in this map, which are parts in the east side of the city, which are low income. Instead, most of the infrastructure has been done uh, around that red orange circle, which are uh, neighborhoods and districts that are supposed to be cool, uh, where the, you know, Roma, Condesa, Polanco, if you're familiar with Mexico City, you know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, so the expectation is that, 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 that public officials and experts are telling me, or told me, you know, that the idea here is to make green lifestyle desirable. No? If, we, if, we, if we make it desirable, if we make the rich adopt this, this, this lifestyle, then the rest of the city will follow. On the other way, on the other hand, if we, if we keep associating bicycling, and people keep associating bicycling with being poor and not being able to afford a car, nobody's gonna get on a bicycle ever, no? <laughs> So by making these kind of decisions, they, 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 I'm arguing that they're reinforcing certain stereotypes and certain hierarchies and certain, certain uh, um, inequalities in the city. No? Um, and, and quickly, I wanna move to what I'm, or what I'm talking, or I'm thinking about uh, how policy, how infrastructure is imagined and how actors involved in mobility are participating in the futuring of the city. Um, and I'm thinking of this as a politics of immediacy uh, and I'm focusing on, on, on pilot programs um, that, work as that work as demonstrations of what is to come in the future around which resources can be mobilized today. So pilot programs such as the bicycle that I was just describing or some of the BRT lines, this is for example the BRT line that's gonna supposedly make Mexico City look like London. Um, pilot programs are not experiments where technologies are tested, instead they are meant to show a version of what the city of the future could look like. They're deployed piecemeal and they're, tar they're targeted in areas where they'll have less friction, uh, but also in areas that will bring about the most visibility and make these policies or these infrastructures more desirable. Thus, they're implemented hoping that the rest of the, re of the reforms that would eventually sustain a scaling up of this kind of policies will eventually follow. And I think later we can discuss whether this, the, much, the, need, the, the deeper transformation are actually taking place or we're just looking at, at some mirages. Um, so I found also that sustainability, it's, it's, a, it's a very contested term, uh, but it's sustainable for, for NGOs, it's not necessarily what activists and citizens have in mind. No? And for the city government, everything can be sustainable on green, no? which is a very uh, comfortable position. No? Uh, but the, um, even toll roads can be sustainable because by building toll roads you are reducing travel times, that means that you're reducing carbon emissions, that means you are a more green city, no? So you, you start getting into this slippery slope of what makes sustainability, no? But this ambiguity, it's, it's, it's ambiguity, it's, it's, very, it's, it's been very productive, no? If you start from the idea that everything can be green, then you can do a lot of things by targeting, by, by painting them green, no? Um, so nevertheless, uh, I think developing transport, Sustainable transportation is, is a very complex problem and the policy actors that are involved in this uh, are very, very, very uh, aware of these complexities and the, and the political and economic and institutional constraints in which they, they are operating. No? Um, that's why, and I think this is key and, and, and very problematic, is that they, they choose or they prefer to work in very piecemeal, small scale projects. Um, they, 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 they prefer to skip the large, larger bureaucracies, larger, uh, larger constraints of, of, 
of citywide development plans, and if necessary, they would bypass uh, democratic processes. No, so they'll they'll basically enact or, or deploy green policies in a very authoritarian fashion. No, uh, just to finish, uh, um, these projects have been controversial, and I'm, I'm I only have time to to mention. Um, one, well, this is the one that I was talking about before. This is a neighbor's um, residents fighting against public uh, uh, parking meters. No, they're evoking Mahatma Gandhi. I think that the, the joke there is that Mahatma Gandhi would 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 be against parking meters. Um, um, but these projects are not are not, are not in controversial. No, and 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 I think in cases like these reflect the tensions between this. The return to the to the central city and this the the, the, the way in which the government has been has been managing uh, uh, real estate led economic development uh, in, as part of a larger transformation um, and they also make make evident the tensions between experts and citizens. No? Experts are operating under the assumption that they're impartial and they oftentimes dismiss opinions of the residents. No? They consider residents selfish and, and uncapable of making good decisions about improvements. And this is just a quick anecdote. Um, in, the, in the left side, there is one of the ma of the the, uh, the brochures that they made in order to 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 convince uh, the neighbors of the, the the benefits of parking meters, uh, which they basically distributed for free, helping the city to implement this project. On the left, uh, on the right side, you have one this thing called. Uh, the urban beaches that were implemented in the city a few years ago. And I put this picture because one of these transportation experts was telling me from ITDP actually was telling me, you know, the problem with citizens is that if we ask them about what they want with public space, they're gonna come up with something like this, like an urban beach. And, and, and I don't have time to give you more context, but the idea here is that, um, well, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna convey this, the, the, the elitism and the and the dismissiveness of thinking about any of, of a, a regular citizen as somebody incapable of coming up with a with a vision, with a with a with an interesting or an intelligent vision of what a sustainable city would look like. No, um, in sum, just to answer some of the questions uh, uh, that were framing this this roundtable, because I think I already went over my time. Uh, I would change the question. Uh, it's not if if does. Sustainable transportation reinforce inequality. I would like, for the time being, say, how is it reinforcing uh, inequality? Well, what I'm, what I've been finding is that NGOs and experts are closing down. Uh, we're, the city government is over relying on them, and they are closing down on alternative ideas of a sustainable city. Uh, and 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 when we're thinking about policy, uh, uh, and we're we're acting, uh, we're engaged in this poli politics of immediacy. And we're thinking that substance is going to follow form. Um, so infrastructures like today look sustainable, like uh, parking uh, parklets and, and uh, pocket parks and bicycle infrastructure and parking mirrors, organized uh, sidewalks, clean sidewalks. Um, they might look more, more democratic. However, they're implemented in a very authoritarian fashion. And we're expecting that. Uh, that just because they actually existed now, they will bring about the necessary changes later on. Um, and I think that's what I had as, um, well, that's what I have as starting points for discussion. Thank you. What I'm going to talk about tonight is mostly focused on New York City and specifically on Staten Island, but it's um, about some of the post-Hurricane Sandy resilience measures that have been being, uh, implemented by the city. On October 30th, 2012, a resident of Staten Island's southeastern shore, a man who I'll call Sam, came home from being evacuated to find that Hurricane Sandy had lifted his house off of its foundation and moved it down the block. One year later, Sam was still fighting with FEMA trying to get an estimate on his property damage. The problem was that when insurance adjusters would come out to do the inspection, they could never find his house. So they would leave and call him and tell him that he had given them the wrong address. Uh, and this went on for quite a while. So aside from raising issues of FEMA-related fraud, um, this story actually includes several bitter ironies. One of them is the fact that a few years back, Sam had actually 
launched a campaign with support from his local neighbors to oppose a new housing oops, to oppose a new housing development on a small vacant lot behind his house. Since the 1980s and 90s, um, new development had been really ramping up on the in the southeastern part of Staten Island. And in the early 2000s, with an influx of global capital, it really took off. And this was much to the concern of local residents. Um, first, waterfront neighborhoods do not, uh, in these particular areas, do not have storm sewers. So vacant lots really functioned as an essential piece of storm infrastructure. And second, beach erosion was far outpacing the installation of fr flood protections. And again, new developments were, were, a lot of them were on the waterfront and they were really accelerating this process. So people who lived there could really see this happening before their eyes, eyes and they um, really opposed a lot of the new development, but they were unable to stem the tide. And as in most neighborhoods in the area, townhouse and multifamily developments proliferated. And uh, we all know the consequences of, of that proliferation of development. So across the island on the North Shore, um, the damage was not nearly as severe, although it did wash up this tanker onto the beach, and that's a picture of flooding on the North Shore, uh, but it was still extensive. North Shore residents believe that they dodged a bullet as their neighborhoods were actually even more vulnerable to storms um, than the South and East Shores. So the North Shore sits on the edge of the Kilvan Cull, which is a narrow tidal strait that divides Staten Island from Bayonne, New Jersey. And during the industrial era, 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 the city installed a port here, which continues to be one of the East Coast's busiest ports. Historically, the port attracted a large number of industries as well as immigrants seeking jobs. Still today, one 5.2 mile strip contains 21 industrial sites, um, and um, all of these 21 sites control, contain some kind of uncontrolled hazardous waste. And you can see that the residential neighborhoods go right up into the, like, the industrial strip. Um, it, this area also houses a large number of migrant communities, including uh, recent migrants from Liberia, Trinidad, Albania, China, Mexico, and Central America. A lot of people don't know that about Staten Island. And unemployment runs high. 15% uh, of households fall below the poverty line. Um, so these demographics combined with the large number of industrial toxic sites makes the North Shore what we would call a typical environmental justice community. And that's, um, you can see the red dots are industrial sites and um, the dark lines would be the population in poverty, and then this is a um, similar map done by um, percent African American. Um, so as on the south and east shores, infrastructure here is really a huge issue. Storm and sewer lines are woefully outdated and inadequate. Uh, millions of gallons of storm overrun are discharged into the Kilvan Cull each year, and flooding is very common. In addition, bulkheads, berms, and other flood protections are inconsistent and often in disrepair. Uh, that's one of my favorite pictures. It's sort of blurry, but that was that's a center, a recreation center that's like kind of on a jetty, was on a jetty, and it collapsed in 2010 uh, because the, um, the, the infrastructure underneath it just kind of rotted away. Nobody was in it. It collapsed in the middle of the night. Um, so had Sandy's trajectory, you know, the trajectory of the actual storm gone slightly differently and hit the North Shore as hard as it did the South, uh, the proportions of this disaster would have been much greater and um, flooding would have not only destroyed lives and property, but the water could have circulated toxic chemicals and redistributed them. So the point is that one part of the tragedy of Hurricane Sandy is that Staten Island residents, a lot of them, knew that they were at risk and um, as you know they live on an island so they were very aware of flooding problems and uh, of problems of flood protection and they had spent years trying to advocate for better protections and less development so um, after the storm some neighborhoods that had seen extensive damage signed on to petitions 
um, and this is on the southeast shores where the dam, you know, entire neighborhoods were, were wiped out. Uh, and they asked to uh, get bought out. They signed a petition asking the state to buy out their properties and return it to wetlands, which is highly unusual for disaster survivors who normally uh, demand the right to return to their neighborhood. But these people had really lost all faith in the city's ability to keep them safe. As one woman said, we did everything right, and this is what we get. And what she means is they had bought flood insurance, they had you know, insured their homes, they were property owners, which is you know, what you're supposed to do in this country. Um, and then they were just kind of, everything got destroyed. Um, so some of these neighborhoods did get the buyouts that they wanted, and that land is being returned to wetlands. But in other neighborhoods that are getting buyouts, um, what's happening is the city has reserved the right to redevelop the land in, in more resilient ways. And so some of that new development is already starting to break ground. So uh, there's a lot of work that is being done, and this is the kind of positive side after Sandy, um, on the beaches on the south and east shores of Staten Island that is really helping improve the flooding situation. They're putting a lot more sand in. They're putting berms. But they're still not updating the storm sewer system, and they have plans for more dense housing. And so that's a cause of great concern to people who live there. Another cause of concern is what I'm going to kind of talk about for the rest of this, which is um, a measure that was recently approved, um, which is for mitigation banking. And um, so this is a, a highly, was a highly controversial measure among environmentalists and environmental justice activists in the city. So briefly, a mitigation bank is um, aimed at solving a problem of development where developers currently, if you're developing on the waterfront and you're going to do something that interferes with an ecosystem, like throwing some shade or uh, causing some erosion, you have to make up for that, um, make up for that. And um, so you find a way to either mitigate what you're going to do or, or kind of invest in a project nearby that's going to help an ecosystem. Uh, but what the city's Office of Economic Development, the EDC, has been trying to do for years is to install a program that is currently available in some other states um, where if you can't find a good way to mitigate the damage for your development, you invest in a bank, a mitigation bank, which is like a wetland, a large wetland project. Um, and the idea is that you buy these credits and you, so you invest in this larger wetland. So you get more bang for the buck because the argument is that the little piecemeal projects that people were doing weren't really doing that much good, but like a large wetland restoration project um, is better. So, um, and I'm going through this quickly, but I can explain it more slowly later. Um, so basically, um, the EDC was trying to do this for years under Bloomberg, and the Bloomberg administration really was trying to get these mitigation banks because they thought that development was very much hindered by the environmental regulations. Uh, but they couldn't get the funding to do a pilot program. So what does this all have to do with Hurricane Sandy? Well, after trying for years to find funding for um, a mitigation bank, the EDC finally uh, applied for $12 million from Sandy Relief money to fund this Marshes project, and they won that. So they got that from the federal government. So um, this is the site of the pilot program for mitigation banking, which is on Staten Island. It's a 68-acre saltwater marsh. Um, and according to the EDC, it's become an informal dump. Um, and the restored marsh will be a healthy habitat for flora and fauna. Um, also, the agency says that the half-mile area surrounding the site is occupied by 200 businesses and 20,000 residents, and they'll all be protected by the restored wetland. So that all sounds good, but the um, interesting part is that environmental groups in this area say that the wetland is already pretty vibrant and that there are a lot of species of flora and fauna already on it and that the 200 businesses are planned for the area they want to put in an industrial park, but they don't actually exist right now. So um, when they're saying that they're protecting these, all of these people, that they're, you know, the opponents of the program say that those people aren't there. So um, 
there are really far-reaching implications of establishing a mitigation bank program in New York City. And so that's why it caused alarm among not just the very local environmental groups, but environmental groups across the city. Um, and also national groups, including the Sierra Club, Riverkeeper, um, Good Jobs New York, Clean Air Campaign, and they've all staunchly opposed, opposed the program. And mainly it's because, okay, so for the environmental justice groups, if you allow developers to buy credits into one mitigation bank, say on Staten Island, that means that they can develop in the Bronx and kind of develop into the waterfront there, but then mitigate totally, you know, way over in Staten Island. So it doesn't do anything to help protect the people who live in the Bronx. Um, and then on the environmentalist side, uh, the bank is just disastrous for the protection of wildlife because, again, if you're going to disturb an ecosystem, you know, in one part of the city, but you're restoring an ecosystem in the other part, it doesn't mean that it's the same ecosystem necessarily or you're going to get the same protection of wildlife or the same kind of birds or whatever. Go there. So um, they really think that this is just kind of not a logical way to go about mitigation. Um, and it also, there was language in this um, proposal that allows for in-water development. So it allows for the mitigation of in-water development, which if any of you know is a proposal out there to uh, put developments on barges in the Hudson River. Someone's nodding their heads, <laughs> you know about it. Um, and they're gonna do it. I think they're talking about a heliport and maybe an entertainment complex and they'll be in these barges. They're allowed to dock for six months and then they have to move. But the point is that if those are going to be disrupting ecosystems, which they probably will, then they can buy the credits into the mitigation bank to offset what they're doing. And so this is really problematic for a lot of environmental groups. But it didn't really get a lot of attention in the press um, or locally. So that's one thing that I'm continuing to sort of puzzle out is why this issue, I think maybe because it's extremely complicated to explain, but it just didn't, you know, and this was part of resilience money, which a lot of people consider just a total outrage. Um, but if this should tell us anything, um, it should alert us to the resilience of the status quo in New York City, which is really pro-development, um, and the degree to which we cannot be sanguine in accepting easy solutions to pernicious problems. Rather, if we want a truly resilient city, we will need to be vigilant about watching for policies that do exactly the opposite of what they promise. It's the least we can do because very real lives are at stake. Thank you. Um, wow, terrific uh, presentations, and um, I'm kind of processing <laughs> everything that I've just learned, and I have some thoughts I kind of uh, developed before hearing all of this, and I have some additional thoughts after hearing all of this, and I want to make sure there's enough time as well for a discussion. A lot of really provocative um, ideas presented. So, you know, the main question guiding our panel tonight, do infrastructures of resilience in the service of greening agendas, sustainable food networks, and environment-friendly transportation alternatives combat or reinforce urban inequality. Uh, and I think, as Oscar put it, perhaps we should put a how <laughs> in front of that question, as opposed to simply an open-ended question. Um, but I think, however we frame it, it's an essential question. Uh, it's something that in my own research I've been thinking a great deal about also um, in relation to questions of disaster uh, and crisis and the process whereby disasters become crises uh, when there are une uneven landscapes of risk and resiliency and some communities have far greater resiliency than others. So, you know, how do we understand resiliency as something that needs to be shared equitably and how is it related to other systems of inequality? Um, yet, as essential as this question is, it has historically been uh, all too infrequently asked at the level of contemporary urban policy and planning around notions of resiliency and sustainability. You know, where is it being asked? And I think the presentations today are really raising a lot of other, 
a, a lot of their spaces in which the question is being asked, certainly by communities in disaster-stricken areas, um, from Staten Island to New Orleans and beyond. Um, it is increasingly being asked by cities and regions unequally threatened by climate change, uh, which we can think about in this region as well as throughout the Americas and, and beyond. Uh, it has received a big boost this week with the release of de Blasio's One NYC, trying to put equity agendas on the, at the center of long-range planning for sustainability and resilience. Uh, and other regional planning efforts are moving in a similar direction, we hear. So there is concept, potentially hope that our analytic lenses are shifting and increasingly doing what Julian Agiman refers to as the joined up thinking that is necessary to address the interwoven issues of social and environmental resilience and sustainability, and the complex material role in, for our discussion today of infrastructure in these efforts. So, but I think that our panelists tonight are really on the cutting edge of social science and planning research that seeks to conjoin these frameworks and also show the difficulty in doing so and the messy politics involved in, in these efforts. Um, they do so through careful, grounded analysis of leading efforts at building resilient infrastructures across different forms of infrastructure uh, in a couple of the cases. So, you know, these innovative new um, mitigation banking schemes, new uh, green transport <clears throat> that encompasses BRT and bicycle lanes, um, I think, you know, in the case of Andrew's work, less focused in what we what we heard today on you know sustainable planning initiatives and more the conditions upon which these initiatives are being formed, which are these inequitable food uh, systems throughout large, expanding suburbanizing areas, um, and the kind of infrastructural underpinnings of that need to be understood for any urban policy that's going to be meaningful in addressing equity issues. Um, so, you know, these are, these are scholars who are thinking across these different forms of infrastructure, different histories behind these infrastructures, and across some of the world's most highly unequal urban areas, New York City, Philadelphia, and Mexico City. And I thought best for us to start off maybe having a bit of a conversation amongst the three of you to kind of think across your cases, both infrastructural kinds of questions as well as um, the, the broader urban political issues that, um, that folks are dealing with and in, in cont contending with and contesting these interventions. So a couple of questions to begin thinking maybe um, in your own case and across cases. Uh, one is, and I think that Melissa was kind of alluding to this at the end, the significance of politics and governance and the degree to which the local state can make a difference in interlinking resilient and equitable infrastructures or not, and if so, how, for instance, the, you know, the recent shift from the Bloomberg administration to the de Blasio administration, from Plan YC 2030 to One NYC, um, and uh, whether this is a meaningful shift, whether indeed these development driven approaches to resiliency is the true, resi <laughs> the true resilience that we're talking about here. Um, so, so that kind of a question. But also for, you know, in all cases, and we have the opportunity to think across different kinds of regimes. Are we just, you know, dealing with a generalized system of neoliberal urbanization in which local governance is not gonna make an impact? Are, we, are there possibilities at the, at the state level for meaningful interventions? Another question, um, has to do with the thinking about the materiality of the infrastructures that you all are looking at um, themselves. So the, the kind of socio-material assemblages that are bound up in these infrastructures. And uh, how do you see the questions of, of equity and resilience affected differently by the particular materialities that you're dealing with? Um, how, and I don't know if any, for any of you looking across across these infrastructures, things came up that shone a light on the particularity also of your own, um, you know, whether green infrastructure, food infrastructure, or transit infrastructure, and things we can learn across those kinds of cases. Um, and then finally, sort of broader political questions, like what are we talking about? What would it mean in, in material terms to create 
what you might conceive of as true resilience in your sites, what kind of politics um, have you seen or could you imagine bringing such resilience about? Um, I think along these lines also questions of how environmental justice uh, organizers and right to the city organizers are thinking together and, and also differently about questions of uh, resilience and uh, needing to kind of update to some degree their politics given the fact that now they're no longer simply contending with people who don't have an environmental agenda but explicitly are foregrounding an environmental agenda. Um, and so how does that affect, you know, contentious and everyday politics? So I'm going to leave it there and, and open it up for our panelists and then we can open it up for our <laughs> of, of seating, or we could, or I could, you know, anyone could just jump in. Go ahead. I'm still thinking. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll start with the second question first. Okay. About the question of materiality, which, um, in terms of food distribution infrastructure, is really a materiality of connection. And so, um, thinking about how to rebuild connections that can overcome spatial exclusions is going to be one of the key issues of trying to address issues of access. And so access can work in multiple ways in this case, and there's kind of like a, a double materiality. There's a materiality on one hand of the, in, the infrastructure of connection, and then there's the materiality of merchandise, of the objects, and especially the objects that people uh, really care about having access to healthy foods. And so um, in that case, uh, you know, there, there needs to be a concern about how to build those connections because we're talking about a highly perishable kind of object. And so to move high volumes of perishable objects from many locations to many locations um, creates all sorts of questions and, and political problems um, in terms of accessibility. And so uh, maybe going from there to the first question of the significance of politics and gov governance. In, 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 in Philadelphia, there have been major efforts to try to address these issues through public and private partnerships, um, trying to get some of the franchise businesses to move into uh, neighborhoods that, that a, uh, a lot of corporations historically wouldn't go into. And so helping them to fund the development, um, and then letting the franchises kind of operate as private entities to, you know, build on the, all of their connections of moving materials. And so there you have a kind of interesting framework that actually is, has spread from Philadelphia to many other locations. Um. Are we going in order? Well, you can certainly come in and respond to each other at least on, in terms of your own case. But you yeah, I mean, <coughs> I mean, the one that strikes me more is uh, as, as relevant for my I mean, the, all of them are relevant, but one that I can address easier, um, I think it's the, the, I find really interesting is the, the, the question of the local government and how, what role can it play or this governance, uh, local governance. No? In, 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 in the case that I'm studying, um, as I mentioned, there's this, I mean, all this interest in, in, in transportation comes uh, uh, around the same time of, of that, that, that certain processes of local democratization and decentralization um, can uh, begin to take shape and formalize. No? So I think more than thinking about whether uh, the government, the local government, the local might be the, 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 the best way to go about it or not, it's actually like the, a lot of the, the, the root of all these initiatives are located in, in the local. Um, and I think, and I, in thinking a little bit more ahead uh, and beyond this particular case, when I'm thinking about BRT as as uh, this um, industrial, like the BRT industrial complex, no, as this larger political economy of 
of, of sustainable transportation and I think lo local governments and, and very small scale interventions are very, very become very important because it's, these are projects that pretty much any medium sized city can undertake. No? So we're, we're looking at a very different, uh, uh, somebody here was asking me about the metro system, uh, somebody in the, in the audience. I think the big difference between something like a BRT or a bicycle infrastructure project is that you can do it very quickly. So they kind of match these this electoral cycles in a way. You can also, I mean, if you start looking into where the money comes from and you look at these, insti these organizations that are responding to some extent or uh, and to funders such as the, the Volvo Foundation or the Shell, so you can see that there's, there's, it makes a lot of sense to break down a lot of these efforts into larger scale that you can move forward. No? So, I mean, I don't want to focus too much on, on trying to point out the, the evil capitalists behind this project, but <laughs> I think, I think the, 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 the idea that, that, that it's easier to start in the local, it's pretty evident. No? Uh, yeah. Same thing with the major, you know, like it's all, it's, for a while it's been well understood or at least well known that mayors were able to come up with more interesting agendas for climate change that, that local governments, I don't know if it's, that's gonna be the case uh, in the future, it's the case now, but it kind of like goes like, mm -hmm. that's how I think about local local governance, no? Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you can, if you wanna go ahead and then I'll come back with, with, yeah, with the other sure. questions. Um, so I've been thinking about this, um, what you brought up about what is resilience, and I've been giving this a lot of thought because I have, um, you know, as the more I'm kind of looking at this, I have, problems with that term and I feel, I think it's, um, you know, this kind of systemic thinking that progressives have been calling for for a long time, you know, that we have to think about things in this more holistic, systemic way and now I'm starting to see some of the problems with that where if you think of things as all part of this one system, then there, you know, it's kind of like if you fix one part of the system, the idea is that you've kind of fixed other parts as well, but that's not necessarily the case, you know, and the um, mitigation bank is a really good example of that. And I, you know, so I think that it's sort of, um, yeah, it's becoming problematic in a different way than sustainability became problematic, but they both sort of were progressive ideas that became problematic. And so um, I'm concerned about that. And, you know, I wonder how much the one NYC could play into some of those risks. Um, I, you know, I don't have an opinion at the moment on de Blasio. I, I know a few things about, you know, his environmental, uh, you know, what I've observed from his environmental agenda, but I'm mostly going around asking other people what they think so far. So if anybody wants to comment on that, I'd be <laughs> interested to hear about it. Yeah, so, and thinking about how infrastructures, the particularity of infrastructures and the materiality is leading to certain kinds of political responses, but also certain kinds of political interventions leading to certain kinds of infrastructures, um, certain kinds of materialities that are beneficial for those, for, for those local politics. So, interesting. Um, but let's, let's throw it open to um, folks and questions that people may have. We only have, but we can we go a little beyond eight. Oh, good. Okay, I've been very mindful of time here, um, but we have a little bit more of it than I thought too. Yeah. Uh, this question is, I guess, for Andrew. Um, I was in Philly in the fall, and we were looking at. Um, uh, the sustainable urban food system there. And uh, one of the places we visited was a food hub uh, called Common Market, I believe. Um, and you know, there's part of this larger conversation about the role of, of food hubs in making, uh, in kind of rebuilding the infrastructure for uh, regional food systems because you know, our food comes from all over the place and part of the reason we don't see so much local food is because small those are small and medium scale farms that can't deal with the scale of supermarkets and these wholesalers. Um, and, and then these you know, local food hubs are also a way of, of aggregating that food and making it more accessible, whereas you know, typically you think of local food as being expensive, it's available 
at farmers markets and CSAs. Um, so, I mean, this local food hub is beneficial for those local producers as well as urban poor, maybe, you know, making this, you know, good food uh, uh, more physically and financially accessible. Um, and there's been kind of, uh, I believe it's in uh, Louisville, there's this uh, major um, uh, food hub development. Um, and there's talks about it uh, in New York as well. So I'm curious what, how you see uh, that, that what, what role you see food hubs playing, if you think they'll be successful, how, how they'll relate um, to these supermarkets, this wholesale scale. Yeah, no, it's a, that's a great question. The common market is very uh, sort of uh, interesting and wonderful organization, actually, um, doing really, really great work. And, and um, my understanding, at least when I was doing the research, was that a lot of their work was on institutional connecting uh, common markets. So they were connecting uh, local farms, and not small farms, but actually pretty, pretty uh, large farms in New Jersey to um, institutional buyers like the University of Pennsylvania or Temple University or hospitals um, who can buy um, in larger quantities. And they were kind of developing somewhat of a niche doing that kind of work. And so I think there is a space for that, certainly. Um, but that, that um, in terms of addressing questions of both food access and um, trying to link questions of food access to healthy consumption, um, that, that's a very different type of question. Um, and you see kind of two agendas emerging simultaneously um, in Philadelphia, one oriented towards questions of access and equi equitable access and improved health for the public, and one about sustainable economies and uh, sustainable farming and the connection between local farms and marketplaces. And so they're really kind of two different political agendas in a way um, that haven't um, unified a vision um, in, in a coherent way, which, which is in some ways unfortunate and maybe something that really people should be working um, toward. Because on one hand, there's a protection of farms, and so there's an issue of of farmers are workers and need protection, need places to sell their products, and so, which is why you see a sort of massive expansion of farmers markets in the United States, but also these food hubs that are expanding as well, really concerned about, about farmer productivity. And then the other side is, the, is consumer protection. And so um, th these kinds of sides haven't really unified, and I think one, one of the reasons they haven't unified is because local production is such a small percentage of production, and so unless you're in California, uh, you know where local production can be a, va a vast enterprise. But um, but maybe not exactly, exactly. I mean that's a whole other issue about sustainability, and, and um, so. Um, but I, but I mean it's really important important point. I think these are two sides that really do need to come together in a way. Uh, yeah. Um, this question is mostly about resilience, but I think it applies to all three of you. Um, Resilience, but also, I guess, food distribution and transportation, it, it, it's, they're very, in a sense, uh, technical and also um, involve the, uh, obviously, interdependence of, of a lot of different uh, players on a lot of different scales, including the regional scale. So I'm wondering how you would envision um, an equity agenda pushing up from um, the local scale and environmental justice communities. I know what in what in you know environmental justice activists get asked that kind of question a lot because um, they you know get accused of just pushing one hazardous waste site or one problem to another neighborhood you know like a NIMBY kind of thing um, and their answer is that you know they're trying to reduce um, consumption and has you know change consumption overall so you know they're trying to think more that nobody should have to bear these problems and I would imagine they would have the same kind of answer about risk is that you know it's they what they would I mean I don't know if they have anything specific but I think they try to think regionally and not not just you know in a really kind of neighborhood centric sort of way anybody else want to take that I mean I <coughs> 
I don't know if I'm going to give you a, a vision of what it would be like, but I could tell you what are some of the constraints of why, at least in the case of Mexico City, there isn't such a thing as a, a, a coherent proposal for a regional transportation equity um, policy or, or a movement towards that kind of stuff. Uh, to be honest, I don't know where in the world that's actually uh, <laughs> happening in a successful way. Um, but uh, um, and, and just to, to go back to, to issues of, of, of governance and, 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 and these things, I think, um, and materiality, in fact, um, there is, in, at least in, in my case, what I see is there's this fetici fetish, fetishization of, of the new infrastructure. No? So there's, you have to build something new. It has to look a certain way. It has to look green and sustainable. No? And I think in, in a case, you know, in a complex metropolitan area like Mexico City, like many other cities, what's more important is not actual uh, new construction or new infrastructure, but, but more of a, of a re retrofitting of the institutions and the legal frameworks that are sustaining uh, certain patterns of, 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 uh, of urban development, certain patterns of economic growth, certain patterns of, uh, of inequality. You know? So I think at some point, the kind of policies that I'm looking at, are the kind of things that people are interested in are not that useful when, you, when it comes to thinking about a larger regional or any other like larger scale effort. No? So it's not a pretty picture, but that's kind of what I, I'm afraid I'm, I, I'm going to be looking at for the uh, next few years. And one thing that I would just add to that real quickly, and, and maybe I can throw this out as somewhat of a question as well, is kind of the relationship between uh, localization and standards, which is, sounds like the mitigation banking in some ways was struggling with that kind of issue. It's like, what role do standard, standards play when, they're when, you have when you have local production, you're trying to extend out from the local, and maybe this is the case too with, uh, with your case, um, is, th is that when you have this local production, the movement from local to something that is regional, there has to be a way of being able to transcend local interests that meet the different sides. And I think you see this with local foods as well, trying to get local foods into a kind of market apparatus. It has to fit into the standardization of the existing market system. And that becomes a very difficult thing for a lot of small scale producers to be able to do. And I'd imagine there might be a similar kind of scenario in, in all of these kinds of cases. Um, so I have a question about, um, sorry, this is loud mic. I have a question about uh, climate change, basically. And you know, um, I guess it's mainly directed to, to Oscar and Melissa, but um, you know, anyone can jump in. And you know, it seems like with both the, the, the cases here, there is a criticism or a critique of a project which is at least ostensibly designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So you know, the metro bus or uh, densification in Staten Island. And, I guess what I'm wondering is, it, it seems like there's a danger here of falling into the trap, which I know nobody wants to fall into, of counterposing sustainability and develop, um, sorry, sustainability and like sort of social equity. And I guess I'm wondering if, and maybe this is a provocation to Musa, if you're not able to go into the big systems thinking, I'm not sure how to get out of it. So for instance, in, with New York, if you don't develop more densification in New York City proper, then the alternatives are basically sprawl elsewhere or densification elsewhere. And you know, there's not a great model right now for densifying suburbs in the US, although people are, are kind of trying. But that would suggest that any an anti-development project in Europe would have to be joined up with some kind of pro-densification project somewhere else. And you know, obviously, with Mexico and many cities in Latin America with BRT, highly problematic. But I guess I wonder, on the one hand, like, is it possible to find projects and to promote them which you know, maybe beyond environmental justice, really do combine a focus on, on carbon um, and social equity? And if not, given the urgency of the situation, aren't we as, you know, scholars slash intellectuals slash whatever, basically responsible for trying to come up with those things to avoid basically being, you know, if not actively, at least passively, a part of the, you know, the opposition between a social and an ecological uh, approach? I think we're just here to point out the problems. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> um, 
I just want to say that um, I think maybe I'm not necessarily against, or the people I work with aren't necessarily against densification on Staten Island. Some of them are, but the issue at stake with that is really that the infrastructure isn't keeping up. So they're they're building, they're bringing in more people, but they're not um, updating the sewer infrastructure, and that sort of speaks to the larger problem of these Band-Aid solutions. And that's what I'm sort of more trying to talk against is that, you know, the solutions, like it may not be as glamorous to talk about updating a, a storm sewer system, but it doesn't mean it, it doesn't need to happen. Otherwise, there's just going to be total, uh, you know, a disaster, literally. So. Yeah, I'm, I have a uh, somewhat similar um, approach. I mean, I'm not I'm not against any of these policies per se. I'm, I, uh, myself, I ride my bicycle every time I, I can, and I use mass transit and all these things. I, I don't like BRT as much as other uh, systems, but I, I'm, I can live with it. Um, but for me, the question is more about um, who gets to decide on these visions of the, solu of, of the solutions or the visions of the future. No? So I think, yes, at, we, I mean, we, can, we can think about the environmental urgency or the sustainability component, the, the, the climate change dimension. But I think at the end, and, and I guess going back to the idea of environmental justice that you wanted us to discuss, the question is about who's making, who's, um, who's idea of a, of, of a sustainable city is the one that we're following, no? Uh, and uh, in that sense, uh, I think it's as important to to think about the different solutions that we might go, the different roles that we can take, as much as thinking about how are we going to make that decision and who's going to participate on this, no? Uh, and and I think you were just pointing to some of the things that I that I think are more 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 important to pay attention to, which is this idea of urgency. You know, with this sense of urgency, you can do a lot of things without thinking you know, about considering others, and that's something that I wanted to 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 flesh out during my presentation. Is like if you if you you want to build a sustainable city that's also democratic, but you're going to build it sustainable now and wait until the crisis uh, uh, already passed to 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 address the democracy deficit, democratic deficits. I don't know if that's going to happen, no? uh, and we can think of many uh, scenarios by which this could not happen. One of them would be that the planet Earth eventually implodes. Uh, but what if it doesn't? And then we're, you know, I can think of many movies that would present a very interesting uh, um, vision of how it would look like if we are not thinking about uh, how are we making these decisions. Not like bringing back the political into into the into the this into resilience, no, or into sustainability. Hello. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in uh, a notion of competing resiliencies, um, particularly social resiliency. Um, and, I th and there are, of course, multiple resiliencies and ideas of them. But um, you know, thinking about infrastructures, built infrastructure, social, social infrastructure, and ecological infrastructure, kind of thinking that triad. Um, I think on one hand, and I'm thinking particularly of an article um, by you, Melissa, on, on uh, the wiped out by the green wave that really spoke to me um, as to how ecological infrastructure, um, greening infrastructure, the sustainability agenda can threaten or be detrimental to social frameworks, to social resiliency. Um, and I think that's, that's somewhat understood. Um, and particularly talked about, and it's now kind of on the agenda through One New York, I think it's realized, um, as how you know, built and ecological infrastructure can threaten social infrastructure. Um, but I think for me that's, that's quite paralyzing. Um, so my question to you is how can built and ecological infrastructure um, or resiliency enhance social infrastructure resiliency um, through thinking about food distribution, transportation, and your example of Staten Island, um, to kind of overcome that paralysis of, of the paradox, of the green paradox um, of resiliency of, uh, you know, developing infrastructure. Um, I, I mean, I, I think, again, uh, it's a question of really th thinking, you know, I think a lot of sustain, a lot of these um, solutions are very short term even though they might sound like they're long-term. And I think that if you really think 
I mean, I think it is a kind of a, a very big picture thinking, a long-term thinking and sort of who, what are, you know, trying to think out what the consequences are of particular developments. So if you're gonna put in a new park or, you know, Greenway or whatever, then it's also not doing it unless you're also putting in some kind of safeguards for affordable housing, you know, to keep people there. And, and again, that sounds really kind of like utopian, but I mean, that's the only way I can really see to avoid these things or, and also to, along with that pass, you know, a living wage and give people access to jobs, you know, all of that stuff has to go together, I think. It's not just affordable housing. Anybody else? Hi. Um, I was struck when, when Miriam said, um, mentioned that the government had gotten the right to build more resilient infrastructures in Staten Island in some part. It just made me think that, I mean, who decides what resilience is? It, I mean, it, it seems like it, the voices of, a, of a people on the ground might not be taken into account in what is resilient to them, because they're gonna be facing the whatever shocks on the ground. Um, so it seems like the solution would be to get all the voices um, the problem would be that that takes too long, and the problem and whatever we're facing is urgent. Um, so I don't know if you have any ideas on how to gather all those voices or the voices that may be required to make that resilience resilient enough. Um, yeah. one thing really quickly. You know, I think that idea that it would take too long, I mean, it's gonna take, it takes a long time to put something in that's not solving the problem and then have to redo it, which we see happening over and over again. Um, so if you're gonna build like these flood walls or some of the gates or things that they're talking about and then they're gonna fail, you know, what? what's the point of that? You know, you spent billions of dollars. So I don't think it necessarily takes any longer to get, you know, to try and listen to people and see what they're saying. And I think that a lot of people are probably, you know, certainly there's dissent, but I think people may have more practical, workable, unified solutions than are, you know, I think that some of, that is some of the kind of pushback. It, like we have to act now and we can't wait for people to just fight with each other and come to a consensus. And I think the point about democracy is a really, good one that you, you don't want to do one without the other. <laughs>